It is six o'clock and it is the first Thursday of the month. And that means it is time once again for the post prison education program radio show. And we are joined live in the studios once again by the post prison education program president and founder Ari Cohn. Ari, thank you for uh, coming in. Uh, and, uh, spending another, uh, <clears throat> another month in, in a different kind of lockdown than in prison lockdown <laughs> than the ones you're, you're used to. Or, oh. So, um, so, and this, we had this last month. We That was when we did the show then. Yeah, we just, can't, you know, started. I can't. People would have good sense, won't leave their homes. And uh, you and I both don't have so good sense. I don't have good sense. I mean, I may, I've even been in prison in the last month. Oh, wow. And uh, so, but. We can't have guests on like we've had in the past. And uh, I really wanted, like I said last time, I really wanted Hannah Myrick and, and Taylor Buck to come do a show without me here and talk about things that they're passionate about. But they're sheltering in place and, and hardcore about it. So they'll probably live through this and... We won't. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so, time will tell. Yeah, <clears throat> I think it's, um... So, for those that are uh, that are gonna see, we shoot video um, sometimes successfully yeah. <laughs> of each of each episode we do. Um, <clears throat> and for those that are gonna be watching the video, they're gonna notice that you uh, have um, some significant um, additions to your fine facial features yeah. that you didn't have last month. You know, I, uh, you could, I could get on a rant about one bus away in King County Metro real easy. So we had, um, you know, the, non the nonprofit, we use Zipcar extensively. And especially if we're going to have a, 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 a prisoner or former prisoner or somebody like that, in the car or, and we had a, um, we closed out the clothing room after 10 years within the last 30 days. And uh, wow. we met, um, Taylor and I met uh, Cammie Carl from Goodwill there to get the last racks of clothing out. And so I had a zip car and I got it, and I had to turn it in the next morning by some time, I forget what. And so I took it I took it to the Green Lake Park and Ride where we picked it up at. And then I had a WebEx scheduled um, for 1030. And I was maybe 10, 12 minute walk from my house, but um, I got out of the zip car, checked the one bus away app it said the next 62 was 24 minutes away so i start walking to towards home and i'm not expecting to hear a bus coming behind me on woodlawn and then i i heard one i, I was so i turned around to confirm it was a bus and it, it, it was the 62 completely off schedule and uh so then i whirled around to start running to catch the bus and you know how roots on trees especially i think on woodlawn all the sidewalks are broken uh and and i immediately so i'm in the first few steps of starting to run full blast and i immediately tripped on a break in the sidewalk and i went face first i mean literally face first into the sidewalk two broken fingers this is healing now this but stitches in my upper lip blood everywhere and the bus driver stopped and she wouldn't let me on the bus because blood just everywhere and i'm like madder than hops she won't let me on the bus because i don't want to walk home like this and so she got off the bus gave me a bunch of paper towels which was super nice and then i got home and uh and anyway so that's what happened so it was like and then uh by the next day, I was ended up at Kaiser Permanente in Capitol Hill for six hours. 
and stitches inside my upper. I'm super lucky that my teeth didn't go. They went through my upper gum, but my I mean lip, but my lip protected my teeth. I'm lucky they didn't break. Then I would have really been in a mess. So uh, anyway, that's that's that. And I look a lot better today than I did <laughs> the other day when this happened. I got to tell you. So anyway. Was. Yeah, when you first arrived, I <clears throat> have heard many of your tales of um, working with different agencies, different people that aren't always cooperative, so I assumed the worst, actually, at first. No, it was like, um, that's what happened. It, it, and it wasn't even a stupid old person thing. It was just like the bus off schedule. And I didn't want to miss the 1030 WebEx or be late or whatever. And I, so I just whirled around and started to run trip, bam. And it was uh, just, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was bad. It's all right now. So anyway. Um, all right. Well, um, <clears throat> a lot has transpired since last month. Um, and you had uh, just been talking about um, that you had uh, off gotten rid of the the clothing room, which is significant because you guys, uh, I just got to see your your new digs um, down in in the Soto area a couple months back. Yeah, and and I hadn't seen that before. I hadn't seen the the clothing room. Yeah. It, was, it was a it was a big deal. What. Uh, what was that for? And talk a little bit about that because um, that's a significant um, change. You know, uh, I th it, it was f years ago. A lot we were still in the central building downtown, and it was pretty cool. So Men's Warehouse chose us. We didn't apply. They somehow found out about us uh, to be the recipient of donated clothes for King County and in Pierce County, they chose United Way. And, um, the, and, and so what happens, you know, every year, this, this coming year will be the first year they haven't done it in a decade, but every year in July, they have a suit drive. And you can, you know, there was, remember there was a King Five did like a, a movie about it. It was really, it was a cool movie, uh, news report movie. But it was, uh, they, you could take your suit into any men's warehouse in the country and donate it and then get a coupon or something so that you could buy, you could buy new suits at half off, basically. And then, then once a week or so, trucks would come from their main warehouse. Like, Men's Warehouse has a monstrous warehouse down in Fife, their central warehouse, just huge. And, um, and so the trucks would go around to the stores, pick up the donated suits, take them to their warehouse, and then one week, United Way from Pierce County would come up and pick up as many suits as they wanted, and then the next week we would go. Um, and then... Uh, Eventually, they opened it up. Uh, anyway, that's how. So we ended up. Uh, we were in the central building, and Wachtel, Washington Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, moved out of the central building, and uh, they had a, a a a room that was open that they used as a central file room for all their legal files, and it was quite large. And, and, and we got the building owner at the time to, like, let us have that rent-free. So that, that was the clothing room for a long time. And then, it, and then it was really cool. So, like, the Federal Defender's Office, this is, this is one example. So Mike Filipovich, who's an angel, is the, is the Federal Defender. Um, and... His office, uh, the women in his office got PO'd that men's warehouse was donating only men's stuff and that women's clothes weren't getting donated. So, so they called up, uh, again, a long, long time ago, they, they called up and would we take women's uh, clothes? And we're like, heck yeah. And, and so I remember one time uh, we, had, we had to take 
Nicole Polly Davenport and I, uh, we had two cars and we had to make m- multiple trips over to the Federal Defender's Office at Westlake. And we had the clothes, the women's clothes, back uh, up above, so you couldn't see out the rear window, which is illegal. And we had to make multiple trips because the women there donated so much stuff. So, so it got to be women lawyers in town. We even had a, a judge, who, a Superior Court judge, and she dresses very nice. And she would pull up at the back alley of the Central Building in her SUV Mercedes um, and donate her clothes. So, it, it and then. You know, until Dow Constantine and his the clown that used to work with him, I've forgotten his name, I blocked it out, I guess. But that when, when they made this move to take the federal, I mean, the, the public defender firms, so uh, Northwest Defender Association, the Defender Association, ACA, SCRAP, and pull them into King County government and, and, until you know, and until that happened, and when we were still downtown, those four nonprofit public defense firms would come down and get whole racks of clothes and take to their offices so that when people were going on trial, they could look nice, right? Um, and then we had former prisoners who came out of the women's prisons who were taking clothes out to the women's prison. Um, so, so a lot of people came to rely on that room, and um, and then, uh, but when we when we left the central building um, and moved in moved to Soto, the only space that was uh, open in that huge building that we're in uh, for the clothing room was too big. I mean, it, and it and so it was about twenty one hundred dollars a month, and with with taxes and shared cost of the building, it got it was like twenty eight hundred a month, as opposed to our cost in the central building was like five hundred fifty dollars a month. So all of a sudden, you're looking at thirty thousand a year instead of six thousand a year. But when we made the move, it was rush, rush, and I didn't want to throw away maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars worth of really nice clothes. So I wasn't going to just abandon the clothes. I would have been as dumb as a dumb can be and uh, so we worked out a deal with the building manager where we're at to do a month by month lease and th- but then we were like you know the first thing that happened was we're, we're like several miles south of downtown and so we're far removed from the public defense firms and they've been assimilated into Dow Constantine's government um, and so uh, they seemed to maybe have lost some of their focus but we were we were remote it wasn't as easy as tda people coming from the eighth floor of central building down to the to the mezzanine level and grabbing racks of clothes and mm-hmm. and then the other and, and then i think covid 19 has had a lot of part a lot to do with it so so we got a we got an email from men's warehouse maybe two two months ago but i had already decided to close the room but it's, they were ending the program so, um, and, and w- Taylor Buck, who works with me, we were out at the men's prison at Shelton and talking to this incredibly great guy um, that works for DOC and uh, in their sustainable, a sustainability lab, which is a, a, an amazing operation. And... Um, and I told him about, and, and it turned out that, that they tried to get suits in for the men there because a lot of people released from Shelton. And I said, we, we've got maybe 12, 15 racks of men's suits, and, you know, if you can come get them, you can have them. So DOC sent a big truck up from Shelton. Um, I put it on Facebook. If you go to the program's Facebook page, there's, you can see a picture of the truck driving away. But it, 254 suits, 12 trucks, I mean, 12 racks. Um, and those, so that there is, those suits are at Shelton now. So, so guys can, instead of releasing with just the, what the khakis that you're wearing, a, a really flimsy white t-shirt and, uh, you can, you can have, you can release with some nice clothes. And, and then, uh, we had a lot of women's clothes that we obviously couldn't send to the men's prison in Shelton. 
And um, so we contacted Cami uh, at uh, Goodwill, who we've partnered with for a long time, and I've been friends with her since forever, and asked her if Goodwill would be interested. So uh, they came down a week or 10 days ago at, with, with a truck, and we loaded all the adult women's clothes up to go to Goodwill. And then, and then we moved the baby's clothes, which were donated by Google employees at, at Kirkland, Google Kirkland, about 30 bags of incredibly nice baby's clothes. We moved those upstairs, and we've got to get those you know, to our main office. We've got to get those down to the baby program at Purdy. But that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, with, with COVID-19, it's, mm -hmm. you know, the, that's on hold till whenever this happens. So that was kind of, uh, you know, even if we, anyway, so that was, that was a sad thing to see come to an end and it'll hurt a lot of people, but we can't spend $30,000 a year on, on a clothing room. And, and the, the, the other thing is I got into an argument with a board member of ours that, uh, uh, uh over this, it, she was like brain dead and hadn't really thought this through but um, it saved us a lot of money so if somebody comes out and we didn't have the clothing room we might send them to Ross and they might spend twelve fourteen hundred dollars buying clothes right but the way we work when we had the clothing room is they would go down to the clothing room and get as much from there as they could that fit them and then we would part. Then we would send them to Goodwill for clothing and, and other support. And then, and then maybe we would only have to spend a hundred and seventy-one dollars or four hundred dollars uh, at Ross or Fred Meyer and Bellingham or whatever, as opposed to what normally, you know, outfitting somebody twelve hundred, fourteen hundred dollars. That sounds like a lot of money, but. It's not a lot of money. If you're going to dress decent, to look decent in school, so you're not going to be embarrassed, or you're going to be able to go apply for a job, do both things, school and job, to to get completely outfitted minimally, you know, twelve hundred bucks isn't a lot of money. It's in winter, when you got a winter coat in the mix and so on, so it was it was a it was a cost saving vehicle for us. So we so from the three thousand a month we would have spent. Uh, uh, for the for the A28 warehouse space of about 1,100 square feet, uh, those costs were offset by not having to buy clothes at Ross or as many clothes at Ross or Fred Meyer as otherwise. So it's kind of it was kind of sad. And, yeah. and, you know, King Five did a, a fabulous. They did like a news report that turned out to be a movie uh, about it and. Uh, they actually watched. They they went down to the prison at Coyote Ridge and filmed a prisoner releasing uh, because they wanted to see him get the men's warehouse suit that they'd seen donated, right? And they followed us. It was so weird. They followed us all the way. We always stop at Perkins Pancake House in Ellensburg. You've been with us before, right? Yeah. And, and they followed us all the way from the prison in Connell up to I-90. Stop, we're stopping at Perkins Pancake, and we got this, these camera crews there's like 11 or 12 of us and they're like all around our table and people in the restaurant are like who are these people and we actually had one couple walk over like who are you what's all this about? but th then they followed us from blueberry pancakes up to the office and they and, and then keith going into the clothing room and getting the suit that they had filmed be donated and then the end of the week they filmed us um at Pierce College in, in Fort Steelacombe, where he's walking in the school wearing the suit that was donated. Oh, that's great! So it was like pretty. So fun. that was with Keith, who was yeah. later employed. Yeah, yeah, with you, yeah. and uh, now is doing great down in Olympia. Yeah, he, he works in a. He's working for Catholic Community Services, and it's so. It goes so against the grain, of of what the public thinks about prisoners and former prisoners. This guy works for Catholic Community Services in a program that partners with the Olympia Police Department. Um, 
and, and in fact, when I coming out of Shelton the other day, uh, I wanted Taylor to meet Keith, and 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 they hadn't met, and so I called and had him meet us at Wagner's, and so his boss from the Olympia Police Department came, and um, and, and and so here I'm sitting with Keith who has like 40 felony convictions on the negative side, on the positive side, a, a, a four-year degree from Evergreen State College in, in Olympia, and six imprisonments, in, and he's part working a, a great job partnered with the police department, and he's high value, you know. So, it was, so we're sitting there eating key lime pie and cherry pie and police and former prisoners and, and, and Taylor with a master's degree in gender studies from Europe, and, and it was it was good. So it was good. So while we're talking about um, ignorance, let's talk about this reporter in the Tacoma News Tribune. Uh, what's his name? James Drew. Uh, D R E W. Uh, so when Inslee. Uh, and it's sad, by the way, to see the News, News Tribune, which was really an ally of ours back in 2006 and seven, when they had completely different editorial people, a completely different political slant, different reporters, um, a, a guy who I worshiped and remember fondly, Joe Turner, who's died since his wife's still alive. But um, the News Tribune's evolved into something just ignorant and deplorable uh, since those days. So, um, and that ignorance came out in, a, in an uh, article written by this guy, James Drew, on April 23rd. Um, the article is entitled State, comma, Inmates Attorney Clash Over COVID-19 Early Release Plan. And it was right after Inslee announced the early releases of 1,100 prisoners, and Columbia Legal Services filed a writ of mandamus with the Supreme Court to try to force the DOC to release um, enough prisoners so that the remaining people who were locked up could, could social distance and not die, right? Um, and... Um, so in, in that environment, this, this idiot, James Drew, uh, a reporter, for the, wrote this horrible article, um, and, he, and he was talking about, um, I mean, he had, a, he had a set in his mind, clearly he had in his mind, who these prisoners would be that were going to be released under order from Inslee. And, you know, aside from the fact that Inslee, for political reasons, is has ordered the wrong people to be released and excluded people who should be released, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you know, I got, and I got to say, I don't know how, I, I admire Inslee. I think he's doing a great job with what he's doing with, coronavirus, COVID-19. I, th I think he's just, he and the governor of California, the governor of New York are just exemplary in the whole nation. So I don't know how somebody could be that competent on one issue and on another issue, prisoners, be such an absolute ignoramus. I mean, and be so governed by politics that he doesn't care if people die and that's what's going to happen. Uh, so anyway, this guy... Uh, this reporter um, uh, I, I should I should I, sh I need to introduce this so if people for people who were around in 2008 in in Seattle Skagit County you 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 should remember that a very seriously mentally ill young man basically rode up and down I-5 one afternoon shooting people to death. And, um, and his name was I Isaac Zamora, Z-A-M-O-R-A. And everybody was terrified and, uh, and, and horrified. 
including me, you know. Um, in the story initially vilified him and 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 then it fell over on his family so the community where his family lived turned against like his mom which was horrible and wrong at, at a very deep level horribly wrong uh, but Zamora was so mentally ill I mean, today he's in the special offender unit, which is one of the highest security prisons in the state, and it's one that's specifically for people suffering mental illness. And based on some recent quotes I've seen in the press, he's still psychotic. Um, and, but in a psychotic episode, out of, you know, you can measure those levels of seriousness with mental illness, just like with everything, I guess. And and he's way up there. I mean, I haven't looked to see whether DOC has him as S code five or 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 what, but he's seriously mentally ill and psychotic and not in touch with reality when this happens. And he 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 killed a deputy sheriff that that he was friends with, who had befriended him and his family. And uh, and then he killed people that he didn't even know. So he, uh, you know, and all I can say is is for people who who might not understand what serious mental illness is about, like go to Mayo Clinic and on their search line put in schizoaffective disorder, and print out the nine or ten pages and sit down and read it. I mean, so that, so that diagnosis is schizophrenia plus bipolar. So either of those things on their own are bad enough, but to have one person have a, a disease that's, that's both of those wrapped into one diagnosis is unimaginable. But there's a significant number of people in the general population and in Washington DOC's prisons with that diagnosis and with schizophrenia and that are bipolar and borderline personality disorder. And, um, and so he, so he he was just not in touch with reality and, and, and a number of people died. Well, one of the people who died was a woman. Um, and her husband, uh, was shot twice, but lived. And so when Inslee announced, the, the rule that he was going to release these 1,100 prisoners, then the daughter of the woman who died and her dad, who had been shot twice, are down on the steps of the Capitol and, you know, on the legislative campus in Olympia protesting. And, I mean, I listened to the daughter. She did a a Facebook thing where Facebook Live, whatever it's called, and and um, I sort of stumbled onto her page uh, by f f I, there was a post that some that I didn't agree with. Um, it was almost like somebody trolling somebody else. So there was a post I did agree with, probably with a Facebook friend of mine, and. But then in the middle of, of posts that were intelligent, here was this idiot with a post. And so I clicked on his name, right? And then that took me to his page. And then I saw the, this other name and, and with a link, right? And I clicked on the link, and it turned out to be the daughter of the mom who was killed. And she's sitting on the back porch of her house, and it was heartbreaking. As much as I disagree with what the News Tribune wrote and what she was saying and her lack of understanding... Um, about mental illness uh, and the way they think of and classify Isaac Zamora and people like him, um, it was hard to listen to her. She was sobbing and in tears, and it was heartbreaking. And it's that happened in 2008, if I remember right. So that's 12 years ago, and she's still heartbroken, right? So anyway, she, this James Drew with the... Uh, with the uh, new with the newspaper, um, Tacoma the, News Tribune. With the so. News Tribune, yeah. I, I'm like, 
Uh, oh, well, I just got an email from the president of your... Uh, no, it's, oh, it's a text. Holy mackerel. Anyway, um, I... Uh, they connected, right? And so he made her be the basis for this article that he put out that I referred to a minute ago. And, and when he wrote about Isaac Zamora, he, there was no background. So people who weren't around in 2000, I mean, with me, I rem, I, I, the minute I read Zamora, I knew who he was. I have talked to his mom. Back in those days, I talked to his mom. What the community she lived in did to her was outrageous. And frankly, what Chris Gregoire, who was governor at the time, did and how she reacted was just dumb effing stupid and outrageous and unforgivable and reprehensible. So it's like when I saw Zamora's name in this James Drew article, with no background, they're just talking about Inslee's, it, he wrote the article as though Inslee had, or everybody that was going to be released on Inslee's order was like Zamora. And he, and he didn't say, he, he might not have even bothered to be responsible enough to check out the story behind Zamora, right? But he, um, I mean, the whole thing back then was so bad. I wrote, I, I had Greg Wire's personal email because I was a big donor when I was stupid enough to, dem to donate to the Democratic Party. I was a big donor, one of the top 30 donors in the state, actually. And, and so when Howard Dean came to town, I was one of the ones in the cocktail party on the top of Smith Tower, right? And, and I wrote Gregoire and Cindy Zender, our chief of staff, and said, I want my money back because of the way she reacted to this. So, but what happened was um, he didn't research Zamora at all. He didn't, he didn't put any context. There was no discussion of mental illness. It was just like this vile guy who has recently said, if I get released, I'll finish what I started. And that's just that's psychotic mental illness speaking, right? I don't doubt that he said that. He probably did say that. But he's super seriously mentally ill, not in touch with reality. And that could happen. Frankly, I wish it would happen to James Drew, right? Um, I do. I really do. And his editors. Uh, so, maybe, so, so maybe they could, somebody in that crew could come away with a better understanding of mental illness. But anyhow, no framing. It was just this horrible guy murdered all these people, shot this young woman's mom to death. Um, Killed the deputy sheriff, blah, 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 and just didn't didn't frame the issue at all, and 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 left readers to believe, you know, in a major, major newspaper that's very well read, left readers to believe that in, that everybody that was going to be released on Inslee's order was like Zamora, and 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 might possibly, I guess, ride up and down I five and shoot seven people to death or something, right? Um, I don't know how to even express it. it, was, it, it Taylor Buck in my office went nuts, and and she she wrote she wrote the News Tribune. I mean, she actually she, I think she asked me for permission, but if I had said no, I think she was gonna <laughs> she was gonna do it anyway, and uh, and then it, she wrote James Drew an email and and copied half the Seattle Times and. Um, and other people, and then when I saw it, and it's on our Facebook page, we posted it. Um, and your website. And we put it on the website. Um, and 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 we, I, I, I had Hannah put it out on our listserv, uh, Taylor's email, but, and, and, and provided the background and could, and, and, and Put, tried to put the thing in context. So, so we should just we should switch over um, and talk about who Inslee is having released and and why uh, and who should be released. And really, you know, I was thinking on the way over here. Just a, by way of introduction, I uh, the legislature had this huge reentry task force. It was legislated in 2005, 
and came into force in the beginning of 2006, and it ran for nine months. And at the end of the nine months, right before Thanksgiving, the report went from the task force to Gregoire, and the objective was to find ways to reduce recidivism. So uh, I, there were four work groups, and I was on, on three of the four work groups. And a lot of the meetings were in Senate hearing room one, and we had Senate, we had legislative staff, I mean, attorneys, we had major resources available. And, um, and so, and members of the legislature were involved, stakeholders, nonprofits, law enforcement, uh, WASPIC, everybody, it was, it was well balanced. And, um, and we got down to a hearing one day, um, because one of the top recommendations of that task force was education, post-secondary education. And, um, and we ended up in a hearing during the 2007 legislative session where bills that came out of that task force were being considered. Um, it was Senate Bill 5070 and uh, Mary Helen Roberts House Bill 1874 were being considered. And I was testifying and hearing in front of James Hargrove, who was chair, he's retired now, he was chair of the Human Services Committee in the Senate at the time. And um, we presented a lot of data and, and, um, and at the end, Harms, Hargrove said verbatim, you know, he basically thought of post-secondary education as being a promising practice. When there was rock solid data that it was way more than that, right? And I almost said out loud, but I kept it to myself. I, I, but I, what I thought, and I, it's all these years later, and I remember, I, I was like, where is Harry Truman when you need him? And that's, you know, because whether you agree with what he did with the atomic bomb or firing MacArthur or any of the things he did, he didn't make decisions based on yesterday's polls. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't make decisions. He was like, I don't care if I get reelected. I don't care. I'm going to do what I believe is right. There, that doesn't exist anymore. And Inslee and all these, here I am like, can't use my first language, which is <laughs> profanity. All these pieces of fill in the blank who are members of the Washington State Legislature. So there's not one person down there who has enough courage to do anything right. And if, if they try to do something right, then like the Democratic caucus will squash it, especially when Chop was, you know, Speaker of the House. But um, I, I just was like, I literally was thinking, where is Harry Truman when you need him? L listening to Hargrove that day. And, and so that kind of, but that kind of legislative cowardice is what's governing Inslee's decisions. And so, uh, maybe David Postman is saying, if you, if you let out people who've committed violent crimes, you'll never get reelected for your third term, right? Or some other person is saying that to him, or he just believes that. But what, they, they, what they've decided to do is release people with nonviolent crimes. And if you were watching the news last week, you can see the result of it already. It's like... Um, I mean, it, I think it was Como. So some guy comes is, is part of this early release, and on his first day out, new crime, high speed chase, and he's back in some jail somewhere, headed back for prison. Right. Uh, so, 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 what? Most of the people with nonviolent crimes are that's like proper property crimes, and they're for the most part stealing your electronics this is a gross oversimplification but you know so they're not committing murder they're not assaulting or brutalizing somebody it's not rape it's so that's how it kind of like uh, it, they're property crimes and property crimes are to get money to buy drugs to feed addiction that's a, a, a fair generalization so if you're going to release people that are Nonviolent, so the public won't get all fired up and you won't have 
idiots like James Drew from the News Tribune, the I-D-I-O-T-S idiots like James Drew and his staff and his li people that he reports to, uh, you know, raising hell, then, you, you know, you can say, well, we're only going to release nonviolent crimes, right? People with nonviolent crimes. They're doing that for political reasons because they're considering what the backlash would be if they let loose somebody who who had committed a serious crime. And the fact of the matter is, for example, people who commit first-degree murder have the lowest rate of recidivism of all classes of crimes, bar none, period. So if you took a, 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 a guy, uh, you know, Don, Don Wilchius, who's been on this show before, um, and I have a, a, a close friend who I'm not going to name, but she did over 30 years in prison uh, against a life sentence before she got out, and she's just living a spectacular life right now. Well, so if she was still locked up, and she's been out for quite a while now, and just is a model citizen, doing beautifully well, um, if, if she was locked up now, she wouldn't be considered for early release, but she would have been the best candidate. Or we're working really closely with a guy. Um, I don't know whether I should name him or not, but I'm going to. Billy Joe Rutledge. So he's in one of the five prisons at Monroe. He's finishing 17 years. Violent crimes. He's the. He's. I'm going to have him at the University of Washington, winter quarter 2021. If I haven't died of a heart attack or been shot or something, he'll be at the University of Washington winter quarter 2021 and he'll do as he might not do as well as jenny burton who just won the truman scholarship but um uh, but he's going to do he'll do really well those are, so so he's those are the kind of people that should be released but they're not and they won't come out and commit new crimes the first day after they release um so so but 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 it Inslee has frame this so we're only going to let nonviolent people out and that's just that's just really truly i don't i don't even have the words to describe how dumb that is and it's going to backfire i got into a um i'm going to risk this i got into a pissing match in an email with roger goodman uh, about a month ago uh, Inslee's general counsel catherine leathers was on the email Sonia Hallam, Inslee's advisor, was on the email. And what I told Roger was like, you, you know, you, this was in reference to the MAT program and Inslee having ordered the prisons to be flooded with Suboxone. So, so but, uh, just dad gum near everybody in the prisons in active addiction. So when they released their inactive addiction, right, um, and then they've got to get, they don't have any money, they don't have a job, so they've got to, go get money to buy drugs to feed their addiction, right? That's how that plays out. And so where I, was, I told Goodman, I, I mean, you're going to see this in increased recidivism rates. You know, a year from now or so, data is going to prove you to be the idiot you are, the coward you are. Uh, and, and Jeannie Darnell, every damn one of them. I mean, really. Um, but that so that but that um, that applies to this. It's this is going to right. You know, recidivism has nonstop climbed since that reentry task force in 2006 that was held for nine months to re figure out how to reduce recidivism. It was about 28 percent then, and now it's just at about 34 percent. And what what's happening now by choosing to release nonviolent people with nonviolent records to appease the an ignorant public that really is ignorant because Bleth and Bleth and Incorporated and the News Tribune and the Walla Walla Union Bulletin and, and so on won't write the truth about who prisoners are. And so, so the public's left to be ignorant, right? Um, and, and so the, he's, he's appeasing this the voting public by saying we're only letting out these powder puff non nonviolent people, right? And he should be letting out people. I mean, some people in that category who have conquered addiction and managed it and will do well. 
but they should also be looking at people with, who have violent crimes that were committed 20, 30 years ago, often, you know, and they've programmed like crazy. They've gotten degrees in college. They've gone through HVAC programs. They're clean and sober. They're future envision envisioning. What they did 20, 30, 40 years ago was a one-time thing. It's not going to happen again. Um, and, and, and it's they're the ones that are safe to release. But then, then you're releasing people with violent crime records, and, and which really has nothing to do. It has nothing to do with who they are today or, 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 or is, what's a wise decision. You know, should we release this person or this person? And, and, and so, so just, it's just leg, a legislative cowardice. Inslee wants to be reelected. Um, you know, and, 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 and maybe he'll be gone by the time the data reflects how bad this decision is. But um, um, it, it's, it's just, it, it's just, it's really bad. I mean, I was talking to somebody who's fairly high up at DOC headquarters this morning about the situation out in Spokane, and um, and it's an early release, right? Um, and and this this exact thing, and and she acknowledged what I'm saying. I mean, so people at D. People at DOC know this is a stupid move, that in, but Inslee's ordered it. See, Sinclair reports to the governor, right? If he wants to keep working, um, then then he better do what the governor says. So he, the governor wants nonviolent, people with nonviolent records released, so that's who's gonna get released. And I mean, the guy that, that I was in this email tiff with and then ended up on the phone with DOC about uh, we interviewed him in a WebEx from the prison at Airway Heights the other day in multiple incarcerations, a lifetime of addiction, a lifetime of going back to prison, um, mental illness, S code two. Uh, the DOC has him high risk to recidivate, but he's a nonviolent, he has a nonviolent crime, right? So he's been, been to prison so, some people I've worked with would call him a recidivating machine, right? So he's just like, come out, you know, release, go back, release, go back, go release, go back. you know, four, five, six times. And ESCO-2, which is a, a DOC classification for serious mental illness, stable but mentally ill. And the DOC has him as high, high, high risk to recidivate. And, but he, because his crimes are, are basically, I mean, they're all drugs and addiction related, they fit the nonviolent uh, classification that Inslee's ordered, and that's who's going to he's going to release, right? And uh, we'll support we're going to support him, and we're, we'll have him at Spokane uh, Community College very quickly. But you know, right now in this in the old days, we would jump in a zip car and, and within 24 hours of his release, we would meet him in Spokane. We would walk the campus, uh, introduce him to advise him, get him enrolled, take him to Olive Garden for his first meal out, take him to JC Penney's for some clothes, put a cell phone in his hand, put a Chromebook in his hand, um, get him a gift card to a grocery store, Winco or whatever's near where he's living. That's all impossible now. Um, and uh, so he'll come out into a world that he couldn't comprehend. I mean, I'm living in this world. You're living in this world. You can't. It's it's surreal. I I I live in a really nice house in a beautiful neighborhood overlooking Green Lake, and 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 it's just surreal. I got I've got this daily routine trying to maintain sanity or find sanity i take this morning walk every day i just it's about a two and a half mile walk i walk from my house up to tangled town and to mighty o donuts i get an apple fritter and english breakfast hot tea and i walk back i mean and yesterday not one moving car which is that's unbelievable and and i didn't pass anybody on any sidewalk 
and that's unbelievable in the in in the green lake area that's unbelievable and and so it's it's just i saw one crow usually there's herds of crows following me around wanting donuts and bread and all that like they're my best friends right and and uh one crow so it's just it's like he's so he's going to come out into this world where everything's closed can't get a job the school camp the, the schools are closed you can't get in touch with anybody um and you know we'll see uh, and you know it's like um and we're down to nine minutes, but it, you know we had um, I think every time I'm on the show i try I say something along these lines, but I've got so many friends and allies that just disparage the d o c to the point you'd think that there's nothing right about the Department of Corrections, and that's just wrong um and so they're out at the prison at Forks. There's, uh, uh, I'm a, I'm a, there's, there's a counselor who's spectacularly supportive of prisoners, but he's not the only one. But um, he advocate, he has advocated for months about um, uh, for this guy who, again, is a recidivating machine, Native American guy, and 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 he just the this guy from DSC basically sort of badgered us into like interviewing this guy and just because we like this counselor and respect him and we worked with him before we decided to do it right and so we had a webex and interview with him five of us on the, on the interview and and we went into the interview thinking we weren't going to like meeting him and that it, that he was going to be like a mentally ill basket case that we couldn't work with and we all fell in love with him i mean really we fell in love with him and we wanted to work with him and we made a commitment right he released and he sounded really great he released to uh, transition house here in town from from the prison out at forks and on and he didn't make it one day uh we weren't we weren't able to make contact with him and so we contacted the lady who runs the house lisa hall and she and she told taylor that he, on his first day he said he was going to the store and he never came back so he's this warrants out for him right and but that's 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 what's going to happen you have 1100 people many of whom are going to instantly you know uh, commit, they're going to commit new crimes trying to not go hungry, uh, trying to not be homeless on the streets, trying to figure out COVID-19 environment we're all living in. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's, the summary, uh, bottom line is Inslee's picked the wrong people for both political reasons. And frankly, somebody ought to lock his ass up down in Walla Walla and throw away the key and then find somebody responsible to put in the governor's office because he's not it. It's really, I mean, and communities are going to pay the price. So that's it. And that's going to seriously impact any potential other future releases like that. When you assume they're all going to point back to that one saying, oh, well, look what happened when Inslee released those 1,100 people back yeah. in uh, 2020. Exactly. And no, nobody will differentiate. Nobody, nobody will differentiate. It's not like I think the general public seems to think of prisoners as one lot of people that are all bad or something, you know. Uh, and they don't say, well, these people are mentally ill. These people suffer trauma, you know. Um, I watched the Centoya Brown documentary that's on Netflix now, and it's very good. She's come out against it because Netflix, for some insane reason, didn't reach out to her. So the, the, her life story, in essence, um, is in this really good documentary with re actual footage of when she was arrested, you know, when she was tried, when she was locked up as a 15-year-old kid. 
uh, when she was sentenced to, to prison. All of that, there's real footage of the courtroom proceedings, of the arrests, of her in jail, interviews with her biological mom or adopted mom. So her, she, you know, she had, um, and I put it on my Facebook. You may have seen it. It was like everybody needs to watch this. It's like uh, so, so. So she has developmental issues, and it comes from being in, inside a mom that during her whole pregnancy was boozing. And so that's called fetal alcohol syndrome. And so she, I don't know if brain damage is the right word, but but she has some developmental issues she knows she has them the court knew she had them um so you've got in in, in locked up you've got people with fetal alcohol syndrome that's not their fault that their mom was was a goddamn alcoholic boozing during pregnancy you've got traumatic brain injury which is really equally heartbreaking or or more i mean that's that can be you know some mother's boyfriend throws the baby against the wall there's people in prison uh when scott frakes was at doc he's now head of doc in nebraska but when he was here i saw a grant that the doc wrote trying to to get funding to just help deal with people who were locked up who pretty much can't succeed on the outside due to fetal alcohol syndrome and TBI, traumatic brain injury. So you've got people in that group, they're, they're hated. They're not, the public doesn't say, you know, differentiate between them and other prisoners. Uh, you've got people uh, who were traumatized by sexual assault and abuse as, as children that are permanently damaged. Uh, and then you've got people with mental illness. And then you've got adults who are mentally healthy and, and, and maybe not addicted who've committed violent crimes. But, but, but it's, just all, it's all across the board, and the public doesn't differentiate. They just think of them as one lot. And, um, and what needs to be happening right now is people need to be making wise decisions. And, and they're not. You know, when Catherine Leathers became Inslee's General Counsel, I was hopeful because I dealt with her. She did a lot of work on a bill that I cared a lot about for Roger Goodman, and and so she, and she was super helpful. So when she, when Nick Brown left uh, Inslee's office and Catherine came over, I was hopeful, but I shouldn't have been, you know. So she got over. To, in essence, to the governor's mansion and ate the cookies with the funny stuff in them, you know, who knows what. And Sonia Hallam came over from DSHS and ate the cookies with the funny stuff in it, and um, and they're just all making really bad decisions. And, they, and, and we're going to pay out here, you know. The public, the community is going to pay because wise decisions aren't being made. I mean, really. It, they should be, like, looking... Um, the guy we interviewed in the WebEx, his his release date, ERD, was November 20th. And last week, or this week, this week, Taylor got a call from the prison saying that he's he's been added to the list for early release and he'll be released within a week. So all of our, the government's planning for his release hasn't even started. The, nav the navigator, her name's Maria Daniels, and that was the, she was the basis for my argument this morning with DOC. Uh, so she's the navigator. She works for the state board through Spokane Community Colleges. She hasn't even been in touch with this guy. So like government's doing, Spokane Community Colleges has done nothing for this guy. Um, and the, the navigator that the state has that's supposed to be helping prisoners navigate into community, has, she's done zip zero nada uh, other than be non-responsive and 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 so now the guy on short notice is going to be released uh and we're trying to play catch up and that's the end of the story all right well unfortunately we're out of time uh so hopefully we can get the update on that particular story next month I hope to God fair. Taylor and Hannah can get 
break out of their houses, <laughs> but I probably not. Okay. You know. All right. All right. Well, regardless, looking forward to either seeing you or hearing from you yeah. uh, this this time next month. Right.